invite you to turn in your Bibles to Romans chapter 13. We'll be reading verses 1 through 7. This is part 2 on fighting evil in the world. There are two distinctive ways that the citizens of the kingdom of heaven can fight evil in this world. Last week we learned of the first one is do not take out your own vengeance when evil comes knocking at your door and affects you, hurts you. Uh, but rather, take up your cross and fight against evil by doing good, even feeding your enemy and meeting his needs. Today we're looking at part two of fighting evil in the world, and that is by way of an institution that God has set up in this evil world for the approval of evil and the uh, squelching and uh, justice served upon evil. And that's the second way, not, not just the personal way that we looked at last week, but the way of the, mag the civil magistrate, uh, an institution that God has set up in this world in its governance. Let every person be subject to the governing authorities. For there is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed, and those who resist will incur judgment. The rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. Would you have no fear of the one who is in authority? Then do what is good and you will receive his approval, for he is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain. For he is the servant of God, an avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. Therefore, one must be in subjection, not only to avoid God's wrath, but also for the sake of conscience. For because of this, you also pay taxes. For the authorities are ministers of God attending to this very thing. So pay to all what is owed to them, taxes to whom taxes are owed, revenue to whom revenue is owed, respect to whom respect is owed, honor to whom honor is owed. Heavenly Father, we do pray for the illumination of thy Holy Spirit that we could have insight and understanding of uh, your purposes uh, in the civil magistrate, in our relationship, uh, both in attitude and action toward that institution. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. When Jesus Christ stood before Pontius Pilate, he said something very significant. It was this, My kingdom is not of this world, and if his kingdom was of this world, his servants would what? They would fight. Because that's how kingdoms are established in this world. They're established through conflict, through fighting, through the waving of the sword. Kingdoms are established that way, and kingdoms continue in that manner. And Christ distinguishes his kingdom from the civil magistrate. The civil magistrate is not an arm of the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is separate from the kingdom of man, both in its authority and in its society. Jesus Christ is King of Kings, and we are the citizens of King Jesus and of his kingdom. And being citizens of the kingdom of God, uh, we do not have to be automatically placed uh, in a position of either submitting to Jesus as king or submitting to Caesar as king. We don't necessarily have to be placed in that dualism of perspectives. In other words, we don't need to try to overthrow the kingdom of man in the name of Jesus Christ. Rather, as believers in Christ who desire to please our God, to honor him with our lives in obeying him and doing good and resisting evil. Uh, we can do so in this 
uh, without coming into direct conflict, Paul says, with the authorities of this world, the, with, with, as uh, we call it, the civil magistrate, the kings, the potentates, the rulers, whatever you want to call them of this age. Now, as we've been looking at this uh, larger text of Romans 12 and 13, uh, I want to, again, draw your attention that Paul uh, has organized these two chapters in an identifiable way with literary clues to understand it. Uh, the first is verses 1 and 2, and that is that we, are, we, are, we respond immediately to the mercies of God, Paul calls us to, by offering our bodies as a sacrifice, as reasonable worship. If you've been saved by Jesus, you turn to him in faith and repentance. It, the next reasonable step is now logical for you as a believer in Jesus to worship him with his people. That's Paul's point in verses 1 and 2. To not worship Jesus with his people is to be conformed to this world which does not gather and worship Jesus, which Paul says don't be conformed to it, but rather be transformed by the renewal of your mind. Your mind is renewed where? First and foremost, by His Word. But His Word is brought to you in different ways, and it's brought to you first and foremost by hearing, preaching, by God's ordained servant. We saw that in Romans chapter 10, that faith comes from hearing. Hearing by the Word of Christ, hearing by those sent by Christ to preach that Word. And that mind is to undergo metamorphosis, go to change. From having an earthbound perspective on life, we're to have a heavenly butterfly perspective on life. Our minds are to be changed. And, and then Paul lays out for us uh, in uh, chapter 12 and 13 the two areas of our existence, how we are to look, the lenses through which we are to look at our life by. The first lens, the priority lens, is looking at our life in terms of the kingdom of God. That's to be our chief priority. We are to give thought, and Paul uh, brackets this section from 12.3 to 12.16 with this thinking, the mind being renewed, to prize and put first in our lives uh, God's people, that is, the horizontal people that we gather with to worship God in verses 1 and 2. But Paul also does not leave out the fact that the Christian world and life view isn't just the kingdom of God. Our lives are carried out in the context of the kingdom of man. And so Paul recognizes what? What he says in Galatians, that this present world is evil. And thus living in this world means negotiating and figuring out in a very prominent way, how am I going to respond to the evil in this world now that I'm a child of the kingdom of God. And Paul then gives us two components. We looked last week at the first one, is responding to evil in your personal life. And that's one of taking up the cross, of defeating, battling evil, not by exchanging evil blows for evil blows. That will cause you to become evil, Paul says. But fighting evil with good. Fighting hardness with softness. Fighting hatred with love. Fighting evil with what is good. And now this week, Paul wants us to understand there, there, that God himself has placed within this world a preventative, a corrector, even a tool of his justice in this world to combat and to deal with evil. That is, God has put authorities within the kingdom of man. Kingdom of man is a temporal realm that has a temporal authority that oversees that realm, even as the kingdom of God has uh, a, an eternal authority. The king of kings and lord of lords who oversees that realm. And so Paul wants us to understand this second aspect for the renewing of our minds that is at work in this world that God himself has placed in the city of man or the kingdom uh, of God 
for the suppression of evil. And, and, and what this informs us of is we do not have to just, as it is, set back in kind of this neutral, well, I'm trusting the Lord phase uh, to uh, defeat or to correct or to respond to evil in the world. Now, that type of passivity is not what Paul's talking about. As I said, Paul, first of all, tells us we are to rightly fight evil with good. Right? And Paul also tells us that God himself has placed, even before the, the consummation, when Jesus comes back, with, as, as Revelation views him, a sword in his mouth to bring justice to the nations, uh, an institution to bring his justice. The text says his wrath upon evil to correct it. So that evil would be maintained, controlled, limited, in this world, why, ultimately? Well, ultimately, so that the gospel can grow in this world. Because as you well know from the preaching of the book of Revelation, what's going to happen, evil keeps increasing until it reaches its point where the only answer to it will be the second coming of Jesus Christ. But in the meantime, the gospel is able to grow through some reasonable suppression and combat going against the evil of this world to suppress it. And so Paul calls us to do what? To be in submission to the civil magistrate. That every person be subject to the governing authorities, uh, for there is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authority resists what God has appointed, and those who resist will incur judgment. Now, Paul is unquestionably speaking of the zealot movement that was operative during the first century. Who were the zealots? The zealots were those who said, look, we're, we belong to God. We're God's people. And here we are as God's people, Israelites, even in our own land, under the thumb of a foreign power. That ought not to be. <laughs> we need to fight. We need to rise up with sword in hand. And so the zealot movement was a revolt movement against the Roman Empire that wound up getting squashed, wound up gaining no universal momentum. Paul is telling us, don't rise up as zealots. Don't necessarily pit the kingdom of God against the kingdom of man. Don't do that, Paul says. The kingdom of God is of heaven. It's, it's of a different realm, has different concerns. So consequently, it's not therefore necessarily in contradiction to the established authorities in the kingdom of man. Paul wants us to understand this. So therefore, while you're here, even though you're citizens of the kingdom of heaven, submit in everything. Be in submission, that every person be subject to the governing authorities. Why? Because they're ordained by God. Now, that doesn't mean, of course, that therefore whatever they say, we just do it. No, there, will, there, there, there has been, there are, and there will be <laughs> situations in which the governing authorities will seek to tell you to do or not to do what God says to do or not to do. And as Peter says in Acts chapter 5, what shall we obey, God or man? There are situations in which we must obey God and in so obeying God, disobey the governing authority. There are those situations in life. We look in the Old Testament. Daniel, when he was in Babylon, by hook and crook, they... Uh, a law was established that you shouldn't pray to any other god. And Daniel went ahead with his window wide open. The curtains were not pulled shut. And he went ahead and prayed. And anyone walking by could look in there and say, hey, there's Daniel there on his knees praying to his god in disobedience. He did it anyway. And so should we. 
If we're told don't preach the gospel, we preach the gospel. It's probably coming down the pike when your pastor is going to be told you cannot preach against certain things. When the law of God calls me to preach certain things. What should be done? Those things are to be preached. That's what's to be done. But by way of a general rule, the purpose of God in the governing authorities in this world is fundamentally a purpose for good. Even though that those things can be corrupted. Now we can ask ourselves, well, well what if a particular government isn't legitimate? Now you can... Yeah. You can enter into those kinds of discussions. Well, whether or not a certain government is a legitimate government. I want you to notice in the text what the text says, what God says. There is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. What does that mean? <laughs> that means that God in His providence whether it's been a good way or a bad way, is the one who has raised up governments and put them in their place. John Calvin says that if there is a power that's in place, it's in place simply because God's providence has put it in place. Therefore, we are to be in submission to it. Calvin says it is a frivolous curiosity to inquire about a government's legitimacy based on how it got there. <laughs> because of this text, you see. If it's there, it's because it got there by God's providence and we need to recognize it. Well, then on the other hand, we may be faced with another question, not so much whether it's legitimate or not, but whether this particular civil magistrate is corrupt and tyrannical, oppressive. Are we to simply just submit when that civil magistrate is corrupt, tyrannical, and oppressive? Good question. Well, first of all, we've got to recognize that the structure, the reality of the civil magistrate is completely of God even though there may be bad people that are occupying that structure and running it. What then? Then what do you do? Can I finally say, oh, civil government, you are a corrupt, tyrannical government, and I'm not going to pay any attention to you whatsoever? Well, the answer to that is no. Well, can any magistrate, can any government ever be rightly overthrown and resisted. Now I offer to you John Calvin's view on this because it's such a difficult question. But I think he gives a good, reasonable, biblically sensitive answer to this question. And that is that all anarchy is wrong. However, if a lower magistrate recognizes that a higher magistrate needs to be removed, then a citizen can come under the arm or the covering of the lower magistrate for the overthrowing of the higher. Now you see what Calvin has so carefully done in his reasoning. He's kept all citizenry under some magistrate, so there's no vigilanteism allowed, no anarchy allowed, no inventing your own lower magistrate, but just simply recognizing that somehow, if God wills it, there may be a lower magistrate that would lead against a tyrannical government, and it would be appropriate to back it. That's all he's saying. Now, putting Calvin aside, we must understand what the context of this text is. Nero! <laughs> Nero! He was the empire, emperor of the Roman Empire. You could hardly count Nero to be anything even approximating a good 
emperor. Yet what is Paul calling to? Paul is recognizing that the fundamental role of the magistrate in this world is for the suppression overall of evil, even though it may be, a, in many ways, a flawed suppression, if not a, 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 an ungodly suppression. It still maintains some reasonable order within the world. And to that, Paul tells us we are to be, what? In submission. Because if we're not, we can incur judgment. In verses 3 and 4, Paul goes on to tell us the basic role of the magistrate in this world. Now, notice what he says, what it is. Rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. Would you have no fear of the one who's in authority? Then do what is good, and you will receive his approval. For he's God's servant. He's God's servant for you, and you're good, but if you do wrong, be afraid. For he does not bear the sword in vain, for he is the servant of God, an avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. So the civil magistrate is, is part of, of the temporal authority structure in the kingdom of man. On the secular arena. And what does Paul say about him? Of all the things Paul could say, Here's what he said. He's for our good. He has a fundamental ministry of good, verse 3. And he has a fundamental ministry, verse 4, of avenging evil. Now, it doesn't come through in the English, but in the Greek, it does come through. These are parallel thoughts. He's a minister of God for your good for your welfare. He also is a minister of God as an avenger, as a corrector of evil. You see how Paul conceives of the role of that civil magistrate in our world. It's to tamp down evil so there's some relative good that can maintain itself so world history doesn't implode upon itself. You see. A civil magistrate He's a minister of God and the purposes of God in providence. This word avenger is the same word that we find in chapter 12, verse 19. Beloved, what? Do not avenge yourselves. But the civil magistrate can do the avenging. You see, that's what Paul is saying. There's an institution in place to do that avenging. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, Paul assures us that God is the avenger of evil. And in Revelation chapter 6, chapter 19, we have this phrase that God has avenged. In verse 6, there's actually a prayer of the saints who have died and gone to heaven, praying for God's vengeance, God's cleansing, God's contradiction, God dealing in justice with evil in the world, which actually will come about at the second coming of Jesus Christ. And so you see Paul is, is not only rattling the cage of, of, of the overly zealot uh, and zealous believer in God, He's not only rattling their cage, but he is also clarifying that there's a distinction between the kingdom of God and the kingdom of man with regard to this question of dealing with evil in the world. The kingdom of God does not bleed over into the kingdom of man so that the kingdom of man becomes an arm of the kingdom of God. Those are separate entities. And yet, while we are on earth, we are to recognize, as Paul says here, and subject ourselves to this temporal authority. And one of the reasons Paul gives, and we're going to see this in just a moment here, that we should uh, submit to this temporal authority is because 
that authority can determine your longevity. Now, if you don't submit to it, shorten your tour of duty on this earth. And that's where we learn of the sword of the civil magistrate in verses 4 and 5, which I've already read. I won't read that again, but God has given the sword to the civil magistrate. What, is, what, what does that mean? He's given the sword to the civil magistrate. It's, it's not a decorative piece like you see over in England. You see these guys walking around with their decorative sword. No, it's, it's a sword used for justice toward evil in society. It's appropriate. God has established it. And we've learned about that in Genesis chapter 4. Remember the sign of Cain. What was the sign of Cain? But the institution of an internal authority structure for punishing evil and functionally being a protector of Cain for anyone seeking some type of anarchical justice for his murdering of his brother. There is the emergence of the civil magistrate and that authority structure for issuing vengeance. Later on, five chapters later, after the flood, we see that authority structure again reemerged in Noah uh, for those who... Uh, those who kill man shall by man himself uh, be killed. Uh, those who murder a man shall by man, the authority structure in the kingdom of man, uh, shall be put to death. That, that's justice. Uh, it's, uh, it's eye for eye, justice. And so Paul affirms that this role is given distinctly to the state. He does not bear this sword in vain. Now we can discuss, you know, what types of crimes and evil uh, would merit the use of the sword. But there's no doubt about it that uh, murder of a human being calls for the sword, calls for justice. Uh, of that we can uh, have no doubt uh, whatsoever. And the usage of the sword uh, for the executing of justice on evil, uh, the putting to death evil people, is uh, a use of justice. It's not a pragmatic sword. Saying, well, okay, if I, if I kill someone for murder, for example, then that will cause other people to be cautious about committing murder. Or if we put to death a, a violent rapist, uh, that will cause pause and deter violent rapes. Uh, well, that's probably true, but that's not its purpose. It's, it's not a pragmatic purpose of deterrence but of justice. That's its purpose. To manifest and administer God's justice for evil in this world. And as an administration of justice in this world already, you see, it functions as an anticipation. If there can be some administration of justice now. You see, by God's servant in this world, it is anticipatory of a coming day where justice will be completely even and square, leaving nothing to be squared up, you see. It is a common complaint against God Almighty that evil exists contrary to His goodness and thus challenges the notion of His goodness and justice. And the Bible informs us very clearly 
no evil of any sort will ever be winked at by the justice of God. It will all be cleared out. The sheets will be balanced in the second coming of Jesus Christ. Now, there are, just briefly, three places where God's justice against evil either has been or will be executed. And the first one is the cross of Jesus Christ. The first one is the cross of Jesus Christ. At the cross, Jesus bore God's justice and wrath, he propitiated, he laid it to rest, you see. Now, if you are a self-conscious sinner, that is good news. But if you're already doing pretty good, and you know, because you're already a pretty good Joe or pretty good gal, that all that's left is for God just to do a little winky-winky and a few imperfections in your life, you don't need the cross of Christ. But if you seriously evaluate your life before the law of God in its transgressions and in its shortfalls, you need escape from God's justice. And praise God, there is escape in the cross of Jesus for all your sins. For there he bore the sins of all of his people. Sins hidden, sins seen. Sins small, sins great. Sins with big life-defining stains. Sins with little stains. It's to the cross we can repair. And the Apostle Paul tells us in Romans chapter 3 that at the cross... I can hear the verdict of God sounded out in the gospel. Your sins are forgiven. You are clothed in perfect righteousness before his judgment seat because Christ is not only the end of the law for righteousness, but Christ has propitiated in justice God's wrath do you. That is good news. That is a display that we should have of the confidence that God Almighty does not wink at any sin and evil in the world in which he rules. The cross of Jesus. And yet there is hope for sinners by faith in Christ. Secondly, God deals justly with sin through the civil magistrate. That's imperfect. Sometimes misses it all together. Sometimes justice is distorted. True. Civil magistrate is fallen men in a fallen world. But it is nonetheless a display of justice of God, as Paul tells us here, an avenger. But lastly, brothers and sisters, when Jesus comes back in power and glory with the sword that proceeds from his mouth, that sort of justice that he will bring in to the nations of the world, the balance sheet will be all straightened out. And the good and holy God of heaven will put an end to every objection if somehow, somehow he has failed as a good God to deal with evil in the world. This should cause us to run to the cross of Jesus Christ. This should cause us also for us who run to the cross of Jesus Christ, as Paul says in Hebrews 12, to, to say to God, vengeance is yours, Lord. Thank God your vengeance has been exhausted in the cross for me. And praise God your vengeance will deal with any evil I've had to endure in this life, and I can defer to you 
and not have to carry the weight of bitterness or vigilantism in my own heart and life. Paul's ethical instruction for fighting evil in the world is informed by the gospel. It's informed by the kingdom of heaven as a realm that is not of this world. As evil people reconciled to God through Christ's suffering, we ourselves now, reconciled through Christ, unjustly taking our sin upon himself for our salvation, to be reconciled to God. Now we, as we journey through this world, can billboard in and through our lives the reality of the cross of Christ. How? As people who take up that cross and defer to God to deal with injustice with the evil of this world. It's our duty and obligation to defer to the civil magistrate and to repay evil with good to show forth Christ until he returns and lays it all to rest. So let us trust in Christ and his cross for our own evil. First of all, let us secondly trust in God as the one who will indeed avenge our wrongs. He can revenge them or avenge them in the present through the civil magistrate as he sees fit in his providence to so use the civil magistrate. Civil magistrate can never completely, perfectly satisfy justice. But we need to, again, trust in God that he will. Civil magistrates, just a faint reflection of the justice that's on its way. The justice that would be administered by the King of kings and Lord of lords. But in the meantime, brothers and sisters in Christ, we hold in our hands, by the grace of Christ as believers in his cross, a trump card in fighting all evil, whatever it may be. That trump card is emblazoned with the five letters M-E-R-C-Y, mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. That is our trump card, either for ourselves, as we appeal to the cross of Jesus for our sins, <laughs> but for others, as we seek to show evil people in our short journey through this world merciful hearts something of the mercy of God in Christ that we have received that they might come to know so they too might agree with us and embrace Christ indeed the real power over evil is not judgment it's mercy that triumphs in the end over judgment let us pray